some people may not be able to um, uh, some people may not uh, be able to stay throughout so in for the benefit of uh, ensuring we uh, have as much of the uh, session as possible with as many people we are making a slightly earlier jump on uh, commencing than we sometimes uh, do for the uh, or Emmett, and it's a pleasure uh, as, uh, as Dean to welcome you uh, not to the specific uh, topic and speaker. Francois will take on the uh, honors to uh, introduce uh, uh, Les, but I did um, uh, before the welcome to uh, this series want to just uh, express a personal uh, sense of um, uh, what a pleasure it is to welcome you back and uh, as Someone who was appointed here with a uh, cross appointment to the then Faculty of Arts. Uh, it was really less uh, Doug Hay uh, when I joined Osgood who were showing me the ropes and how to, to really live um, commitments to more than one part of the university at once and uh, really uh, grateful for uh, what uh, I learned uh, from uh, the trail that uh, Les had blazed and great to see you back here. So uh, you'll hear more about him in a moment. The Or Emmett series really began in 1976 at Osgood and has been a feature throughout much of its history in, in one of those ambitions that we very much take to heart, the study of law in its broadest sense, integrating uh, history, religion, culture, supporting research, discussion, dissemination, uh, and it was uh, given new life, uh, I think at around 2010 or so, when the Nathanson Center brought the Or Emmett uh, series under its uh, banner and uh, from that point uh, forward has really become an annual event in our research uh, calendar and brought in uh, thought leaders and uh, really uh, important compelling speakers and topics uh, across a range of fields uh, ever since and today is certainly in keeping uh, with that tradition and uh, grateful to all the work that goes into planning uh, the lecture each year, to colleagues uh, at Nathanson uh, for keeping uh, the flame burning and uh, or Emmett of course uh, invokes light and the light that shines on uh, these topics when we investigate them uh, rigorously and creatively. So with that, uh, let me again welcome you to this uh, 2017 uh, or Emmett uh, lecture by uh, Les Green on uh, sovereignty versus sovereignty. I know who I think is going to win, but I don't want to spoil it for everyone else. And uh, please well, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Francois Tanguay Renault to say a few words on behalf of Nathanson and introducing Les. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Uh, it's not every day that Osgood has the chance to welcome back home one of its prodigy children. To be sure, this is most uh, certainly just a matter of speaking, of course. Our distinguished 2017 Oramet lecturer is no puerile or adolescent scholar anymore, but the one and only professor of the philosophy of law at the University of Oxford, Leslie Green, uh, who uh, was elected to this prestigious chair, which was previously, as some of you may know, occupied by Joseph Raz in a personal capacity in 2006. And he's also the Pauline and Max Gordon Fellow at Balliol College, Oxford. So I take the liberty to talk about Professor Green as one of ours, even though he was born in, I take it, Bridge of Weir, Renfrewshire, Scotland, uh, even though he was educated at Queen's University down the road, as well as Oxford, where he, he worked with, uh, again, one of ours, uh, as a Canadian artist, Charles Taylor and, and Joseph Raz. And even though he now has a part-time appointment at Queen's University and an adjunct appointment at McMaster University. I do so because, as many of you will know, Professor Green spent most of his illustrious career here at Osgood and in the Department of Philosophy of York University, of which I, I welcome um, members today. Of course, Les, we wish that you had never left, but be that as it may, your memory and your legacy lives on. I say legacy because I'm one amongst the many great things that you did before you left was presiding the recruitment committee that appointed me, a professor at Osgood. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think not a year goes by, really, uh, without me hearing some kind of 
anecdote or stories shared quite fondly by colleagues about, about uh, Les Green from one of your uh, erstwhile colleagues. And so needless to say, we're thrilled that you have agreed to join us again here today. Uh, I don't need to tell you this, but Les's reputation as a world-class uh, legal and political philosopher is now uh, very well established. Uh, as a result, he has, throughout his career, uh, been invited to be a visited professor at notable institutions such as Bolt Hall Law School at Berkeley, NYU Law School at Columbia. Uh, he also visited at the University of Chicago and uh, held a part-time appointment at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Les, as many of you will know, research, uh, researches topics that are mostly focused on jurisprudence, constitutional theory, moral and political theory, as well as law and sexuality. He currently serves on the board of several top journals, uh, and he's also the editor of the uh, annual Oxford Studies and Philosophy of Law series and of the prominent monograph series, Oxford Legal Philosophy. His own 1990 book, The Authority of the State, uh, has rapidly become a uh, jurisprudential and political theory bestseller. Uh, it is a must have for any legal and um, philosophy, philosophy library with some self-respect. Um, and indeed his more and more than 40 um, scholarly articles have been published in most top journals in the field that you could think about, ranging from ethics, the, jur the, the, uh, journal, the, the philosophical quarterly, the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, legal theory, the Journal of Political Philosophy, as well as a plethora of leading US and Canadian law journals. Um, by and large, all these pieces have been known to leave, I think, no one indifferent because Les is really known for his argumentative persuasiveness, his razor-sharp analytical rigor, and often controversial and original positions. Um, so uh, he has dedicated his career to make people think, to make people think hard. And uh, most recently, he's even taken this passion to Instagram, uh, mostly to set the interweb straight about botany and, and, and the marvels of the English countryside, but more, more, more to the point, to the, the, the blogosphere, right? So uh, making sure that the, the world of ideas, including uh, pressing issues like Brexit, Trumpism, the fate of academic freedom, remains semper veridis. That's how he wittily uh, entitled his blog. It means always green um, in the idiom of Shakespeare. And today he promises to, to edify us yet again uh, about an issue that in perhaps too many ways weighs heavily on our minds following recent political developments around the world, perhaps, perhaps most notably in Europe. That is the issue of, of sovereignty and puzzlingly, as the title of the lecture I think provocatively suggests, how sovereignty may interact or conflict with sovereignty. Once again, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Osgood a proud Scot, a proud Canadian, a distinguished and accomplished legal philosopher, but most importantly, one of our own, Professor Leslie Green, to lecture us on sovereignty versus sovereignty. Uh, uh, Lauren, um, François, th thank you for that. It's embarrassing to have an encomium like that uh, in front of a group of people, almost all of whom know most of it is untrue. <laughs> Um, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to be giving this lecture. I think I've probably heard 18 or 15 of them. And uh, as I said to Rob in the way, and I never really knew what or Emmett meant. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention um, in years gone by. I want to talk to you uh, today about something a little bit out of uh, my usual safety zone um, in constitutional theory and something which a number of you here have written and uh, written, I think, probably more powerfully than, uh, than uh, I have. And this is the idea of sovereignty, um, something that, if I, if I say so, I think Canada has broadly got right um, over the last 30 odd years. I know that's a controversial view in this law school, but um, something which the UK and the EU, um, the US and other places are getting, I think, tragically wrong. Almost uh, 20 years ago, uh, Neil McCormick said that we live in a post-sovereign world and the idea that state sovereignty is a nostalgic mythology. N Neil was responding to two trends in law and politics. Many states increasingly entered complex and restrictive legal relations with each other, and the global spread of capitalism limited 
many states' freedom of action. About the same time, Saskia Sassen said, the result of such forces is that even in rich and stable states find themselves losing control, the title of her famous book, losing control not only over policy, but even over territory, as state law competes with the norms of global capital, as well as with international humanitarian law. Now, whether those forces are still in the ascendant is now perhaps open to doubt. The United Kingdom's, or to speak more plainly, England's determination to leave the EU, or Israel's tightening grip over the Palestinian territories, or China's self-assertion in the South China Sea, or Donald Trump's declaration of America first, none of these suggest to me that sovereignty, national sovereignty, is a spent force. But perhaps we can acknowledge that, as at least as an ideal, what McCormick called post-sovereignty lives on. And I think it has made us more alert to the ways that sovereignty may conflict with cosmopolitan notions of justice, of human rights, and of environmental stewardship. Because all of these can conflict with sovereignty, we're going to have to choose between them. And the mark of a normative conflict is that the more we satisfy one ideal, human rights say, the less we are going to satisfy another, say, national sovereignty. And that's why we cannot have what Donald Trump and Theresa May want, namely full control over national borders, while at the same time respecting the rights of refugees, or honoring our duty to share a land that others shared with our parents or grandparents. That sovereignty generates conflicts that, like those, I think won't come as a surprise to anyone in this room. After all, the modern state was born in conflict with cosmopolitan claims of a universal church and empire. Those writers who see in the last few decades an unprecedented and untheorized emergence of non-state law, of legal pluralism, of soft law, transnational norms, and so on, have simply forgotten their history, including their legal history. A complex, fluid, hybrid, overlapping set of authorities is where we started and what we thought about and what we theorized for almost all of the career of legal philosophy, long before the rise of the modern state in the 17th century. In legal philosophy now, everything old is new again. In this lecture, I want to explore some conflicts about sovereignty, but not those ones. I'm less interested in, say, the conflict between sovereignty and human rights or sovereignty and the environment than I am between what I'm going to call sovereignty and sovereignty, conflict between sovereignties. In particular, I want you to think with me for a few moments about the relation, relations among state sovereignty, popular sovereignty, and something which this country is now luckily free, in my view, parliamentary sovereignty. And I'll explain these three notions, how they can and do conflict. I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about the UK, but uh, I'll mention one or, two, one or two other things as well. How they can and do conflict. And inevitably, I'm going to say a little bit about how I think some of those conflicts uh, might be resolved or should be resolved. In an era in which know-nothing populism is again on the rise, it might seem dangerous to affirm, as I'm going to, popular sovereignty over state sovereignty or parliamentary sovereignty. But it seems to me that an ideal is open to abuse is no reason to doubt its validity. Okay, let, let me start with a few brief, and therefore I'm afraid these are going to be terribly dogmatic uh, definitions of the three sovereignties, the conflicts amongst which I want to explore. So by popular sovereignty, I mean the thesis that peoples are entitled to choose their own constitutional orders some very basic way, their own form of government. Parliamentary sovereignty, of course, is just the familiar idea that a representative legislature, anyway, is entitled to supremacy over all other lawmaking authorities in a jurisdiction and should not be subject to substantive disabilities in legislating. Familiar Dicean idea. And state sovereignty, I mean nothing other than the conventional claim that a state is entitled to supreme political authority within its territory and should be able to exercise that authority with reasonable independence or anyway without coercive interference from other states. So internal supremacy, external independence. 
Now you'll notice that I identified those three, or defined the three, popular, parliamentary, and state sovereignty, in terms of entitlements. That is, in terms of rights, powers, liberties, and immunities. Already you might have some worries about that. For example, you might think that reference to what someone is entitled to do cannot be understood without the idea of sovereignty. It helps us understand what it is to have a right. And second, you might think that what matters here is not what anyone is entitled to do, but what they can, as a matter of political fact, actually do, or perhaps get away with. So let me say a word to try to sideline both of those worries before I go on to the core of the argument. When H.L.A. Hart tried to explain what it is to have a right to do X, he said in a famous essay, it's like being a small-scale sovereign with respect to X. Now, if Hart were correct about that, then my definitions would seem circular. For I want to say that sovereignty is be like being a large-scale right holder, not the other way around. Contrary to what Hart supposed, however, there are individual rights that are not rights of action or decision. For example, my right to health care uh, here or in, or in the UK. It's not a right to a sovereign choice, or anything, it's just simply a right to a good. And we cannot, I think, without artificiality, explain all individual rights as protecting choices. Sovereignty, on the other hand, of any of the three forms I mentioned, is primarily concerned with who gets the say, or maybe the final say, over some political, economic, or social matter. And indeed, it's because sovereignty is like a protected sphere of decision that Hart was, by his analogy, seriously misled into thinking that all individual rights are a species of the right to choose. The second worry, that what matters is not the entitlement but the actual efficacy, <coughs> is a wider one. Political scientists and sociologists sometimes think of sovereignty in a non-normative way, as the actual capacity to act, say in the international realm, rather than a normative power to do so. And no doubt that's why some people think that nuclear weapons or the international capital markets or digital communications have undermined state sovereignty, because certainly all of them affected every state's capacity to act untrammeled in the international sphere. But this posits far too simple a connection between efficacy and sovereignty. If Russia seizes Crimea, we don't say that Ukrainian sovereignty has been refuted. We say that it's been violated. The relationship between effective control and sovereignty, so to speak, is not constitutive. It's either presuppositional or justificatory. I mean this. If an entity has no actual chance, no actual chance of asserting its will, a state say, then there may well be no point in a lawyer asserting or denying its sovereignty claims. It'll just be pointless. The presupposition of talking about those claims is that they might have some effect. So it seems likely to me that a minimum of effectiveness is presupposed in our statements about what sovereign entities are entitled to choose. But that's not to say that the entitlement is constituted by the efficacy. Or as a moral matter, we might think it's wrong or imprudent to assign or ascribe sovereignty to an entity that's unable or radically unable to exercise its will. It seems plausible that at least part of the justification for political authority lies in the actual effectiveness of, of states at performing certain morally important tasks, for example, keeping the peace. So it would be wrong to ascribe sovereignty to a state that lacks any actual capacity to do that, at least within its own borders. Well, that's what I uh, want to say about, um, really all I want to say at the conceptual level about those three ideas and, and how I flesh them out. I'm ha happy to talk more about it. I want to move towards the conflict. So we've got three sovereignties, the triangle, and then we've three sites of conflict. That these three ideas are different is not, I think, denied. But on some views, including what I'm cheekily going to call the English theory of the Constitution, the uh, English theory of the UK Constitution, a line of legal thought running from Hobbes and Bentham, Austin and Blackstone to Dicey, and reiterated just this week by the UK Supreme Court in the Miller decision, these three sovereignties, popular, parliamentary, and state, though not the same, are mutually supporting. Rejecting, the, uh, rejecting any suggestion the clear result of a fair referendum itself has any legal significance, 
the Miller court cites with approval Dicey's words. The judges know nothing about any will of the people except in so far as that will is expressed by an act of parliament. Put another way, there is no, on this view, there is no popular sovereignty that's not parliamentary sovereignty. Well, what then of state sovereignty? Again, the court tells us once parliament has spoken, any dialogue between the legislature and courts or between the legislature and the executive, the issue in Miller, comes to an end with the final say of parliament. The UK state does not act as a sovereign entity save through its parliament, Miller tells us. And that's the whole point about the restriction on prerogative power. And then finally, what of the relationship between popular sovereignty and state sovereignty? Well, as you probably know, the peoples of Scotland and Northern Ireland voted by an enormous margin to remain in the EU. But the only member state with a say is the United Kingdom. And again, the court in Miller affirmed what is actually trite constitutional law, that the Scottish Parliament or the Northern Ireland Assembly speak for their people only insofar as the Westminster Parliament permits them to do so. And the Westminster Parliament reserves to itself all constitutional authority in the UK. So there's actually no force, we learn, in either a statutory declaration, as we have it in the 1915 Scotland Act, statutory declaration that the Scottish Parliament is a permanent feature of the UK Constitution. What could that mean in a Dicean world? Or <coughs> to a statutorily recognized convention, the so-called Sewell Convention, of, of seeking the consent of the devolved legislatures before intruding in their jurisdictions. Many of you remember these issues here. I certainly do from the Quebec secession reference and, our, 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 and the patriation reference as well. I'll say a little bit about that later. Now, obviously, the particular form of this English equivalence in English constitutional theory between popular parliamentary and state sovereignty relies on local reflections, local features of the English constitution and English legal thought. But in its more general form, we see it elsewhere too, including here in, in Canada. For example, in the hostility of courts as one possible voice of the people in the idea that rights of indigenous peoples or minority nations are exhaustively codified, frozen forever in a federal constitution, or in the idea that the right to self-determination of peoples in public international law must be restricted so as to respect the sovereignty of states. So I'm going to talk about the English example, but I hope these ideas all sort of ring reasonably familiar uh, to all of you. So let me take these just uh, in order. Let's start with the collision, as I see it, between popular and parliamentary sovereignty. Popular sovereignty, I think, is an ideal of political morality, by which I mean it's a state of affairs to which a polity should, but might not live up. Popular sovereignty is realized when the people have ultimate political authority. But you ask, isn't that just democracy? Isn't that what democracy is? Well, no. It's important to keep a fix on that term, ultimate political authority. In popular sovereignty, this means that it is the people who should choose the most basic, most fundamental terms of their association, who must choose what sort of constitution they want to have. But democracy is just one kind of constitution that a sovereign people might choose for itself. Democracy means something like rule by the people, rather than, say, rule by the priests, or the military, or the experts. If the people of Saudi Arabia or Iran were given the opportunity to ratify a constitution, and if they should choose, as they might well, theocracy instead of democracy, popular sovereignty would be respected in that ratification, but democracy would have been rejected. The familiar confusion between popular sovereignty and democracy arises from our modern sense, really a 19th century sense, that there just are no feasible options for government apart from democracy in one form or another, and that whenever people were given a free choice, say in Saudi Arabia, they would obviously choose democracy. But is either of those really true? At the very least, it seems to me, doubts can be raised. In Plato, we learn, and I think this is correct, that one downside to democracy is it's epistemically wasteful. People who have genuine expertise, think of climate change or saving the whales or GMO crops. People of genuine expertise can easily be outvoted by gangs of know-nothings. Plato said, 
democracy is like handing over the governance of a ship to people who don't sail and decide on the course by majority vote. You would never do that in sailing, says Plato. And even in modern societies, when given a choice, people in fact don't always choose democracy. And I doubt myself very much that if Saudi Arabia or Iran uh, were given such a choice now that they would very obviously uh, vote for democracy. Now, I've talked about the rights of peoples to settle their own constitutions, and I, I saw several of you bridling properly at the mention of the people, das folk, and so on. So let me just say a few words about that to put your minds at ease. I, I, I'm sure I can't do it fully, but um, he, here I'm using the term people just as John Rawls uses it in his book, The Law of Peoples. And a fixed idea is you may think of them as a subset of national groups. Not all national groups, but many national groups. So, for example, the way I see it, the Palestinians are a people, the Scots are a people, the Kurds are a people, but lawyers and Freemasons and Presbyterians are not peoples, even though they are groups with the capacity for self-governance and so forth. I'm presuming, as did Labbé Sayez, that there can be peoples before its constitution. Indeed, that peoples can constitute a constitution, say, by ratification or, or in a referendum. What does it take to be a people? What are the conditions that those groups satisfy? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but it seems to me three features are important. One is a primary capacity for collective action. I mean, a capacity not granted to it, say, the way we grant capacity for collective action to a corporation through formal law. But maybe, maybe the way um, we, we might, as a group of friends, have a capacity for uh, collective action, voting on what movie to go to, or something like that, members of an orchestra primary capacity for collective action, and it has to be the case that life prospects of members of the people are significantly affected by the capacity of the people to make those decisions. So the capacity of the group to decide its own affairs has to importantly affect the well-being of people in the group. Now this stands uh, in conflict with a number of views in political philosophy. Um, Immanuel Kant fam famously said before a constitution, he meant a lawful legal constitution. No, the Constitution Act. Before that, there are no peoples. There's just a mob, said Kant. But this strikes me as a very strangely legalistic view about collective action. For our set of humans to be a people, of course it needs to be the case that it can flourish or perish as members of that set, have a stake in its prospects, and have a primary capacity for collective action, but there's no reason to think that for that we need a legal system. I mean, it couldn't possibly be true. Human beings were around for about five million years of history before there were any legal systems, and we have lots of evidence that they acted in corporate ways. And we know that their rights, I wouldn't have described it this way probably, their rights had been and could have been violated, for example, by conquest, inheritance, and enslavement. So people were enslaved before legal systems, and they had their um, their, their property uh, dispossessed before legal systems. I think what Kant is getting wrong here is the distinction between two sorts of people. The sovereign people that I have in mind, the uh, pouvoir constituant in say as typology, and the post-constitutional people, in which, for example, we might say the people of Saskatchewan, a people created by a constitutional order. I'm interested in only the first, the kind of primordial uh, people. Now, admittedly, even if law is not necessary for the constitution of the people, it obviously can help create one as they come to identify with and have a stake in their own legal systems. We, the people of the United States of America, it says in the preamble. But that people that's speaking, I want to argue, is the constitutional people. So this is a difference from the usual way of thinking about it in American constitutional thought. So, for example, the Canadian province of Saskatchewan and the American state of Wyoming began as arbitrary rectangles drawn on the map by 19th century lawmakers. But over time, political institutions grew up within those rectangles. They gave birth to Wyomingites and Saskatchewanians, to state birds and provincial songs, to affections and loyalties. They gave birth to peoples. So I'm not arguing that there was just some one set of peoples at the beginning of the time who had titled the sovereignty. Peoples come and go. In fact, we think about it very odd to think that the groups entitled the popular sovereignty were fixed at some time in the past, like, you know, 1648 or something. That'd be a very strange view. If a people comes to have the features that I pick out, 
then I say they have a right to determine their own constitution. Then you might say, well, what becomes of the sovereign people after the constitutional moment? Some people think that the people is functus officio once they've set up their constitution. That's it. It checks out. And from now on, it's a matter for the lawyers and congressmen, senators and judges. Others are tempted by the more romantic ideal um, that the people sits in the, back, in the background, somewhere off stage, waiting for a crisis or a disaster emergency to be called on um, to a speaking role. I don't think we have to settle that. Certainly the fact that there is always a constituting popular power doesn't show that it was always the same constituting power that shaped the existing constitution. So, in Canada, the constituting power was at least three peoples, possibly more. But now there's also another people, the Canadian people, constituted by that. And that's a different people. There's no reason one couldn't be a member of two peoples at once, just as you, well, you could be a member of two clubs at once, or two universities at once, or two law faculties at once. In any event, whether there is a popular sovereign, sorry, whenever there is a popular sovereign, there is a possibility of conflict between what it's entitled to and what the post-constitutional sovereign claims for itself. So first, people may not choose to live under a regime of legislative supremacy at all, right? That was the whole point of the American Revolution. The foundation of the American Constitution was a rejection um, of parliamentary sovereignty. Indeed, it's an interesting fact that almost all peoples who have actually had a choice about constitutions have rejected the model of parliamentary supremacy. And second, um, the people anyway may have views about which powers their sovereign parliament should have and which it should not. Now notice this conflict between popular sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty is not only a conflict between popular sovereignty and full-throated Dicean absolutism. Suppose Trevor Allen is correct when he argues that moral and principles implicit in the common law limit the UK Parliament's authority to pass, say, a statute requiring that all blue-eyed babies should be put to death. I think this comes out of Dicey, actually, this or, or, or Cook, someone, this original. Well, suppose that's latent in the common law. Be that as it may, no principle in the, derivable from the common law, or common law constitutionalism, as it's called in England, will show that Parliament lacks the power to legislate in the teeth of or to reverse the result of a border poll in Northern Ireland or an independence referendum in Scotland. There's no doubt whatever that Westminster has the power to change or repeal the Scotland Act by simple majority to tamper with any of the devolution settlements. There is no need for it to consult, let alone seek consent of the Scottish Parliament or Northern Irish assemblies in leaving the EU. We've just learned this in Miller. Westminster has kept all those powers to itself. Even the Sewell Convention, the court says, is at the mercy of parliamentary sovereignty. So deeply rooted in the legal system is the supremacy of parliament, I'm thinking here obviously of the UK, that it would actually take a change in the rule of recognition to alter it. A statute or even a court decision might mark the beginning of such a change. But because the rule of recognition is customary, we won't know whether a particular decision or statute was the beginning until a custom had stabilized on its basis. And in the meantime, conflicts between popular sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty are in the UK and in other countries with a strong parliamentarist tradition, not only possible, but endemic. And that's true at least whenever there is a unitary constitution assigning supreme authority to a single legislator. Let me look now at the second uh, of my sites, so the second of the I should have, clearly should have had PowerPoint. I should have put up a triangle. So now I guess I'm on where am I? The bottom of the triangle, popular sovereignty and state sovereignty conflicts. It's obvious, at least I hope it's obvious, that nations are, as they say, imagined communities whose boundaries can be controversial and overlapping. But that's also true of churches. It's true of universities. It's true of political parties. It's true of families. Many days I'm tempted by the medical, metaphysical thesis that it's true of individual persons. <laughs> We're imagined and constructed out of the loose and untidy narrative of our own lives. Yes, it's true that nationality can degenerate into tribalism. We see it all the time. But remember that individuality, as Mill warned us, can degenerate into selfishness. 
Are nations in some way more imaginary, more contingent, more constructed than families or churches? Is nationality more open to abuse than, say, individuality or religion? I can't make sense of any of these questions. There's no metric of comparison. Nations, peoples, are socially constructed in one way by one set of forces with certain effects. Families, churches, religions are constructed in another way with different forces and a different set of effects. As far as I can see, as far as that goes, they're all pretty much similar. But it does seem clear that those who think we should be sensitive to the moral standing of individuals and churches are not entitled to reject the moral claims of nations or peoples merely on the ground that those are imagined communities. It's very, it's just, it's very puzzling. People are warning us all the time about the recrudescence of sovereignty and nationalism because it can go bad. They seem to be completely unaware of the history of religion uh, or individuality in a capitalist world, which also can go bad in related ways, and I think for the same reasons. I mean, anything can go bad, right? When nations are candidates for popular sovereignty, when they satisfy my condition of peoplehood, the potential for conflicts with state sovereignty arises this way. Sovereign states claim, as I said, supreme territory over an authority, but the unity, integrity, and efficacy of sovereign states are subject to disruption by the claim of national minorities. Obviously, we think of independence movements, but also various other forms of devolution and local power growing up within a state. So not just globalization, but also internal contests uh, for authority. Indeed, since 1945, it seems to me that the most serious challenge to state sovereignty has actually not come from the global capital market or international humanitarian law, but from national self-determination movements around the world. Now, in the paper I quoted at the beginning, um, Neil McCormick says, and I'm just going to quote another passage, I have a feeling that this paper was actually an Orr Emmett lecture. It has just occurred to me right now, because I remember hearing it, and I think I heard it here. Something's come full circle today, I don't know what. Neil writes, whether it's possible to envis envisage a world beyond the sovereign state in which new types of legal and political action come into being that exclude claims of out-and-out -out sovereignty, either from old states or from new communities devised to reorder um, uh, economic and, and political co uh, coexistence is a question of the first order. Now, McCormick himself gave an emphatic yes to that question. We could imagine non-sovereign political entities. The EU is the example he had in mind. And not only is it possible to imagine them, McCormick thought it's necessary to do so if we're to remain faithful to reality and also if we're to remain sensitive to important values, justice and human rights. In a memorable phrase, McCormick wrote, we should think of the loss of sovereignty as like the loss of virginity, something that can be lost without another's gaining it and whose loss, in apt circumstances, can be a matter for celebration. Now, like many others, McCormick thought state sovereignty a bad idea. I, I share some of his worries. But in that famous article, you won't find a single clear statement of why he thought that. For that, you have to look to his other writings on nationality, and at some points in the interstices of that paper. State sovereignty can evidently conflict with even the legitimate claims and modest claims of national minorities. Not just independence, more modest claims than that, to a share of a relative autonomy. And that's why McCormick was so keen to exclude claims to out-and-out -out sovereignty, either from minority nations or from new entities like, say, the EU. I think the idea is that if communities, whether national or transnational, should moderate their claims, this is what he's thinking, to something short of out-and-out -out sovereignty, the depth or scope of this sovereignty conflict might be contained. There's also another moderating device that McCormick doesn't mention, and this is the right in international law to national self-determination. In customary international law, however, this applies only to colonial peoples, peoples under foreign occupation, and racial groups denied equal access to government. And many commentators have complained of its narrowness and urged ways to bridge it with other forms of protection short of statehood and so forth. But be that as it may, none of the actual claims, um, none of the actual conflicts facing today in Europe or elsewhere are claims that fall under that rubric, even if extended. I mean, no one thinks the Scots are an oppressed or colonized people, uh, not even an internal colony. Um, but that just emphasizes the depth of the conflict. The legitimate claim to popular sovereignty cannot be contained 
within the narrow bounds of the right of international law, even when supplemented with non-discrimination norms from international humanitarian law. It's more demanding than that. I mean, in Canada, one sees this most clearly about the claims of indigenous, uh, indigenous populations, right? Well, we're left with the third side, third and final side of my triangle, and then a few words, uh, a few words to kind of sum up where we're at. The final side of conflict is the, the tension between parliamentary sovereignty and state sovereignty. My, my experience in thinking about this is my colleagues usually get the first two. Sometimes after I pour them an extra stiff gin and tonic or something, but they, they kind of get the first two, but they find it puzzling how state sovereignty could be undermined by parliamentary sovereignty. So I'm on a bit thinner ice here, so I'll, I'll skate more quickly to see if, it will, see if it will hold my weight. First, a conceptual point. As Herbert Hart argued half century ago, there's no necessity to have an organ with absolute authority in any state for that state to have external sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis other states. Well, it's kind of an obvious point. So if any state is still or now sovereign, the United States is, but there is no organ, not the legislature, not Congress, not Senate, not the court, that enjoys Hobbesian sovereignty within the United States. Its sovereignty is outward looking only. Indeed, there are so many veto points and checks in the US Constitution that gridlock is producing a failing form of government because it can no longer marshal enough authority to do the ordinary business of governing, just raising the fisk and paying the bills. Hart said it's just a dogmatic assumption of some philosophers to suppose that in every state somewhere, if we just look for it, we must find this secret sovereign that has the final say, or as Schmidt used to say, you know, the final say in the moment of emergency and exception or something. This is, this is just a piece of dogma. There must be a such person that has it. There may not be. And yet, it may be externally sovereign. It may be, have reasonable independence of all other states. In fact, I think that probably no state ever had, even according to its own constitution, the kind of absolute sovereignty that Hobbes, Bentham, and others thought had to rest somewhere or other. Even an omnicompetent parliament, like that of the UK, free of a rigid constitution and judicial review, can only legislate in ways provided for by its own ground rules, by the ground rules of its own constitution. There are nonetheless, although they don't have to have a, a plenitude of powers, there are some powers that every sovereign state must have, I want to claim, in virtue of being sovereign, and this produces the third and final conflict. The most important of these powers uh, a sovereign state must have is the power to bind itself by treaty, pacta sunt servanda. Now, some writers see in this principle um, some kind of contradiction. And they try to resolve it by introducing what seems to me a new contradiction. Here is their puzzle. How can an entity with supreme authority ever be bound? I mean, if it could be bound, doesn't that show that it wasn't, after all, really supreme? And if it was really supreme its authority, doesn't that show that it couldn't really be bound? At least not by, by treaties or customary international law. And then the apparent solution they introduce to resolve this fake uh, paradox is to say that, well, they could be bound by their own consent, by their own agreement, supposing, I guess, that being bound by one's own agreement is not being bound in any way that limits one's own authority. I take it these people must never have signed a contract. I'm not sure. But this is widely said to be true. To bind oneself is not to be bound. But this is obviously a bad solution to a non-problem. And interestingly, it's a bad solution that in his very last posthumous publication, Ronald Dworkin bafflingly led, lay at the feet of all legal positivists who have ever written. He said this is, they were committed to this crazy view. It's bad because a state's own agreement cannot bind it unless the principle, pacta sunt servanda, is itself a valid binding principle. You know, that's the principle under which contracts bind. And that cannot be binding Without circ and, sorry, and that cannot, without circularity, rest on the agreement of states to follow it. Right? So you can't promise to follow the principle of pacta sunt servanda and then under the aegis of that principle be bound by your treaties, because what explains the binding force of the first agreement? It's a very familiar old point made, made by Hume and others. Most inter international lawyers say, and I think this is correct, that the pacta principle, to the extent that it is binding, is so as a matter of custom and convention, not state agreement. That's to say, essentially, they follow Hume's view about promises, or later, Hart's account of the rules that determine the basic sources of law in a legal system, what we now call 
the recognition rules. And this is a solution. And whether or not I think it's a good one, it is a solution to the problem. And it involves no paradox, since recognizing that a custom is binding is not agreeing performatively to be bound by that custom. So recognizing, um, following the force of a binding uh, custom, or finding it as binding. My colleague, um, Timothy Endicott develops this point in a fruitful analogy with individual autonomy, freedom of a person. There are freedoms worth having, and there are freedoms that are valueless, and there are freedoms that are dangerous to have. So the reason that even voluntary slavery contracts are, as they should be, void everywhere, is that having the power to bind oneself in that way is not a power worth having. Indeed, it's a very bad power to have. If you're deciding on your contractual powers, you decide not to give yourself the power to sell yourself into slavery, even in extremis, because after all, you might use it. And that could be, uh, for reasons Locke and others gave, disastrous. But note that that is not some conceptual, theoretical, logical, philosophical argument. Well, it's a philosophical argument. It's not a conceptual argument. It's an argument about the kind of powers it's dangerous for us to have in light of our well-being. And just as there are powers that it's dangerous for us to have and dangerous for states to have, there are powers that we have to have. So to be free, we have to have the powers ourselves to be able, if not contract, maybe that sounds too formal, we have to have the power to promise to enter relationships with other people, or else you're not free enough. You have to be able to bind yourself to be free. And for a state, of course, the coordinate here is the power to enter treaty. Every sovereign state needs that power. Well, how does this collide with parliamentary sovereignty? Maybe you can see w w where this is going. The ship's running towards an iceberg here of Dicey. Of course, Britain is bound by its treaties. Nobody denies that. But Britain's own theory, as is Germany's, about how it's bound by its theories is what's often called dualism. No treaty, did I say theory? No, bound by its theories. No treaty uh, is binding of its own force. Every treaty in Britain must be actuated, made binding by parliamentary legislation. And as we learn again in Miller, not even binding by an executive act if parliament has acted anywhere in the neighborhood. So the position is rather different, for example, from the United States. There is, in a system of parliamentary sovereignty, there can be no equivalent to Article Six of the US Constitution that reads, this Constitution and the laws of the US which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Well, I can see the international lawyers all giggling when I say in the US law treaties are supreme law of the land, but that really is the constitutional position and they really are meant to be bound by them as supreme law, coordinate with statute. That's not the case in the UK. Well, what does this excursus into this kind of formalistic point reveal? This, I think. One of the incidents of state sovereignty, an incident that's morally, not logically necessary, morally necessary for a state to do its job, is the power of a state to bind itself. And that's an aspect of full legal personality of a state. One of the central incidents of parliamentary sovereignty is supremacy of statute over any and all other sources of law, therefore, of course, over treaty as well. Treaties are binding in the UK, of course, but only as long as Parliament agrees. And again, by the parliamentary sovereignty theory, one Parliament cannot bind its successor. Now this week, of course, we're all focused on a particular treaty, uh, the EU treaties in Article 50, and on the courts holding that this Parliament remains and must be, remain free to accept or repudiate the results of the EU referendum, and that it must exercise affirmative control over the exercise of executive authority, prerogative power as it's called, in triggering an article of exit. This has already been hailed, I'm sure you know this, as a grand triumph for parliamentary sovereignty. Perhaps it is. But if the UK state can only speak through primary legislation, then it will, of practical necessity, be a less faithful partner in any pacta that it should enter than it otherwise would be. This is an old problem in the UK. The treaties of union between England and Scotland, 1706 and 7, contain supposedly unalterable articles of union, securing the Scottish courts, the Scottish church, and Scottish representation in the new parliament. 
It wasn't long after 1707 that the UK Parliament began to tamper with each of these, McCormick against the Lord Advocate. And by the way, in an interesting, talking about things coming full course, the McCormick in McCormick against the Lord Advocate was Neil McCormick, the legal philosopher with whom I began this lecture, Neil McCormick's dad, um, which was decided in, in McCormick against the Lord Advocate. The issue in the case is whether in Scotland, Elizabeth II could be Elizabeth II, because of course there was no Elizabeth I in Scotland. Uh, and, and the court made short shrift of uh, treaties of union and a bunch of other things. And then what about this? Um, three so-called Scotland clauses from the 2016 Scotland Act, the devolution settlement, most recent uh, part of the devolution settlement. I'll just read these, it'll just take a minute. Um, 63A1, the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government are a permanent part of the UK's constitutional, I'm not going to read them all. You, could, you can already see the problem. What on earth does that mean? a permanent part of the UK's constitutional arrangements. Now, obviously, um, the Scotland Act 16, uh, um, 20, 2016 is a statute, it's not treaty. But now imagine, and Canadians are good at this kind of exercise, now imagine a new constitutional, constitutional settlement with, shall we call it, sovereignty association, and similar terms in that new treaty. Would we have any reason to think in a system of parliamentary sovereignty that those norms would be any more secure than the Treaty of Union 1707. Well, let me just summarize. The idea of parliamentary sovereignty, a legislature that, though bound by law, is unable to bind future legislatures, has now become a hazard. Many people have suggested it was suggested in Canada in the 1980s, I think correctly. This was never the official view at Osgoode, but I thought, I thought this was correct, and I still do. Many thought that such a legislature is a hazard to human rights, or to liberty, or even to the rule of law. How can Parliament be bound by a law if it can repeal any law that binds it? How can there be a protected sphere for human action if any Parliament can lawfully make any incursion it likes, or anyone that can sustain a majority? How can human rights be secure if human rights can be enacted, then repealed and modified at the whim of a shifting majority? And add to that the glaring fact of political sociology that in the UK, electoral, or under UK electoral range, arrangements and current political economy, the voice of parliament is often no more than, what, uh, than the voice of the South of England, what Lord Hailsham called an elective dictatorship, at least when his party was not in power. I've tried to raise today two worries that ought to trouble even those of you who think that sovereignty is the most important political ideal, or those Republicans, so-called, or political constitutionalists who want to give it greater weight than it now has. Everyone knows sovereignty can conflict with sustainability, with justice, with human rights. But notice that it can also conflict with two other sovereignties. Parliamentary sovereignty can conflict with state sovereignty. Maybe we're not so worried about that, because both of those are institutional devices to serve some other ends. But I've tried to show it can also conflict with popular sovereignty. And popular sovereignty, unlike parliamentary sovereignty and unlike state sovereignty, is a moral ideal, something worth pursuing in itself. Thank you. We have plenty of time for, for questions. Um, as a usual, because it's being recorded, make sure you have the microphone in hand. Uh, before you ask a question. Who would go start? Uh, please move <laughs> Professor. Well, that was fun. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I have lots of questions popping up, but the first one is kind of doctrinal, forgive me, but it yep. really is how do you get around the fact that the Parliament actually passed an act to authorize the referendum? Mm -hmm. So Arguably, there's already been parliamentary validation of this referendum, mm -hmm. and presumably then what came out of the referendum. So how do you yeah, so, so no, that's a really important doctrinal question. I'm very sympathetic with what I take to be, if it's not your view, the view that you're mooting. The court didn't accept it, and here, here was the reasoning. Um, this is not the first time the court has set up a lawful referendum. And other times it's done it, both in 1975 um, and in the um, alternative vote referendum, it set up the legislation this way. It said the following will happen and will come into force on the date of such and such happening in the referendum. If it doesn't happen, the referendum won't happen. So the referendum 
was a preset trigger to switch by the people in which a legislative program would begin. This referendum was not framed that way. But it was lawfully set up, it was prescribed under the Elections Act, the same way, everything else, but there was no automatic trigger. Why? Well, now we have not a doctrinal point, but a political one. Um, uh, Cameron was convinced he would win. And there was no need to provide for something that was just not going to happen. And by providing for it, you know, in the off chance that they lost, this was just going to cause trouble. One would get a second bite at the cherry. The difficulty is when the ballot papers actually went out, it said on the top of the ballot papers, and remember, this is prescribed by the Electoral Commission. This is not just advertising. It said, your vote is important. This will decide whether or not. Now, legislation didn't say that, but the ballot paper said that. So then you can't go back to what I think in Canada would call a clear majority and say, well, forget that. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Uh, I don't think it was an accident that they didn't provide for a, a legislative tripwire. I think, I think they just thought, well, we're going to win. And someone said, well, what if we don't? They said, well, we'll just come to that later. Uh, and then you might say, well, why do they insist on, why do they attempt to trigger Article 50 by use of executive authority? I have some sympathy to the government's view. If you take the view that that's res judicata, the people have decided the issue, then I just myself think that there are good political arguments to give the government, now that it has to negotiate with 27 member states, lots of freedom of movement about the timetable, when to strike, you know, maybe it looks like right now we can avoid the German election if we do this, if we do that. Once it's back into Parliament and the ping pong between uh, the Lords and the Commons and Lords, remember in the Lords, the government doesn't have a majority. Uh, they lose control of the timetable. So you might think, as I think it was a disaster to vote, I would never have voted yes to leave, but if they vote leave, I would prefer the executive to have power to move flexibly and quickly to secure the best deal, than even if we're not reopening it morally. That, that's how I read it anyway, I'm not sure, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Les. That's Thanks, a very Tom. stimulating talk. And I, um, you mentioned sort of the internal, external domains of yes. sovereignty, especially in relation to the United States. Yeah. Uh, but with regard to the UK as well, uh, when you're talking about parliamentary sovereignty on the one hand, yeah. it seems to me that's an ex internal matter it is. that depends entirely on the uh, UK constitution, the unwritten constitution. Yeah. When you talk about state sovereignty, it seems to me that's more an international law issue. Yeah. And so I think there is... There's a question here about choice of law. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the binding effect of treaties, mm -hmm. um, I think one needs to look at, well, binding under what system of law? Mm -hmm. So a treaty might be binding internationally on yeah. the UK, but not binding internally yeah. uh, if Parliament doesn't ratify the necessary terms of it, or if Parliament, in fact, rejects it. it. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the conflict of law issue? That's well, really that's one of the questions. conflicts I want to. So I, I agree with what you, what you say there. That that's one of the conflicts I want to draw attention to. So as I say, the UK system and others uh, you know, have a so-called dualist system. Treaties are not self-executing. Something must happen in the domestic plane um, for them to take effect, uh, and therefore the nature of domestic law affects how faithful a partner you are in bargaining externally as 27 nations have just discovered, right? Um, so I don't agree, I don't disagree that there's you know, a choice of, you know, and you could, it could perfectly well be saying, well, perfectly well be true that in the international plane this treaty is binding on the UK, and never mind what Parliament says. And one can go to the ICJ or someone and get a ruling on that. Or, uh, you know, to take a closer analogy, uh, the European Court of Justice and get a ruling on that. But, you know, that and 350 will get you a chai soy latte in Westminster if you don't want to do it. And that fact can undermine your external. So that's what I'm getting at. Not, not, the conflict is um, an unrecognized fact because there's a temptation to think that the stronger our internal legislative institutions, the more powerful externally we are. And it's just as an error. In fact, very strong concentration of power in internal institutions by making you an unfaithful partner elsewhere can make you, I'm not, by the way, I, I'm not saying must make you, of course, that's not true, but can, can produce a, a very serious conflict with external sovereignty. And this is not widely recognized, certainly not recognized in the response to either the Miller decision in the 
district court are now in the Supreme Court. So everybody feels that they've got control back again, yeah? But you know, what, what kind, you know, I mean, th think of someone who, who you discover will always break her promises to you. So are you going to deal with them anymore? Now, I realize triggering Article 50 is not breaking your promises because it's a lawful mechanism provided and so forth. But you, you see how the tension kind of mounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So let's change the question on this one again. Thank you. Um, I feel like um, two of your sovereignties are very similar to each other. Parliamentary sovereignty and state sovereignty look very similar to me. Parliamentary oh, okay. sovereignty is just the internal version, and state sovereignty looks more like the external version of the same basic idea with maybe some nuances. Popular sovereignty, as you define it, seems completely different. Yeah, well. And so I, it's not, to me, that surprising that it would end up having a moral content that the other ones don't, because you, you define it in this very, unless I miss something, in this very minimal way, where it's, it's like, well, people shouldn't have political institutions imposed on them against their will, or something very well, that, minimal that, that like follows that. From that. I, I, I argue the affirmative, that, that every people has a right to choose its own constitution, and therefore yeah. it should also be imposed upon the, the will. But I was wondering if there's, um, is there any, are you committed to a view of popular sovereignty that would make it a little bit more like parliamentary sovereignty and state sovereignty, so that these, when you, you're, these, these, this capacity for collective action that you say is, is part of the idea of, of a people, that that would somehow correspond to a moral ideal that could have a, a more significant content? Or is it just, yeah, we shouldn't impose institutions on, on people against their will? Is it just this minimal So I, I think there are two constraint. things um, you're curious about here. One is, given that parliamentary sovereignty, state sovereignty, or popular sovereignty are different, why do we all call them all sovereignty? So I will say something about that. What they, so what they have in common? You know, what warrants us thinking of all these as sovereignties? And the second, your second point, I think, is, is a bit different. It's why don't we find in popular sovereignty replicated some of the features of state sovereignty? So is it something like that? So, so OK, first one, um, what, what do they all have in common? Well, I suggested at the beginning, uh, against Hart and others, that I thought we can understand sovereignty as a kind of rights of control. So there are three species of rights of control of groups. One is the right of a people to control its constitution. One is the right of a state to control its, you know, roughly its policies internally and its external relations with other states. And the third is the right of an institution within a state, let's say parliament. I mean, it could be, you could have judicial sovereignty, that sounds like a bad idea, but parliament, I mean, it may even be worse than parliamentary sovereignty. Um, parliament, of a parliament or a legislature to control its relations with other organs within, say, with the court. Yeah. So in the United Kingdom, the court lacks the power to strike down primary legislation, even if it decides that it's inconsistent with the Constitution. It makes great efforts to find that it's not inconsistent. But even if it does, it lacks the power to do that. Within Canada, the court does have the power to do that, subject, of course, to Section 33 and so forth, uh, maybe Section 1. So th those, are, those are how they differ. Um, and so what do they have in common? They have in common this notion of someone who has the final say, the supreme say, in some sphere. And the spheres are different. Now, why are they so different? Well, it seems to me there are two kinds, well, lots of kinds of concepts out there. But there are at least two kinds of concepts out there that are worth noticing in um, political and, and legal philosophy. Some concepts are predicative, and some are attributive. So for a predicative concept, you know, suppose sovereign were predicative, like blue, it's a predicate. If you say, you know, a blue shirt and a blue painting and a blue sky, they're all blue in the same sense of blue. It's just blue is a predicate satisfied by a shirt or a painting or the sky or something else. But then take an adjective like large. Large does not function as a predicate. So a large mouse is smaller than a small elephant. You say, well, how could that be? How could that be? Because what large means is, lar large mouse means large for a mouse. And what small means an elephant is small for an elephant. So there's no logical puzzle in why 
a large, large mouse is bigger than a small elephant because it doesn't function as a predicate. It functions attributively. Sovereignty is attributive and not predicative. A sovereign people is something that is sovereign for a people in the way that people are supposed to be sovereign. A sovereign legislature is something that is sovereign for a legislature, has the attributes of sovereignty. So that's one of the reasons, for example, that state sovereignty has this interesting feature that I think is under-recognized. One of its incidents is the capacity of a state to bind itself. Very interesting incident. And it's, you know, it's not really worth having an argument about whether it's part of the definition or not of a state, but it's just so central to the way the notion of a state functions. It's, it's part of what we think of as full legal personality. You enter into agreements and treaties with other states. It's like, we say, how come that turns up in states, but with respect to peoples, you talk about something more general abstract, just their capacity to, um, their entitlement to choose constitutional order. It's like, well, that's what it is for our people to be sovereign. So th that's a, a kind of long-winded way, but that's, it, it's one of those terms that, that, that can't be analyzed as something is X and F. It's something that is X for an F. Does that help a little bit? Anyway? Yeah, okay. So Patrick, I, I'm just going to ask a question and then pass the microphone along. Yeah. Um, so I just want to press yes. a similar question, though it doesn't go completely in the same direction as Louis Philippe. So, so you propose three kinds of sovereignty, yeah. one of which is attributed to the people, yeah. the people being this uh, collectivity that has the capacity to act prior collectively, capacity. right? So yeah. prior capacity. Yeah. Uh, parliament, presumably, is also an institution composed of people who can have the, this capacity yes. to act collectively. Yes. Parliament can act. Yes. One could view the state as something like this too, right? So all the institution, along with the people in the democratic state, that together act to do certain things. Now, I know from some of your readings that you don't think that about the state. No. Right? You think the state is a different kind of thing. You yeah. think that the, the state is something that act as if it were a person. It's right. more of a fictional idea. Right. So when we think about the nature of the conflicts between uh, the different kinds of sovereignty, what does it entail for this kind of... Uh, equation, if you want, that one of the entities that you're talking about is not really an entity. We just ascribe it the notion, because what we're really talking about in terms of treaty is really the executive or the crown, right? The state is not known to law in England, yeah. right? So, so, so I, I, I'm just a bit worried about the fact that, you know, you're talking about sort of more foundational kind of entities yeah. and the rights that they have and this fiction and the rights that it may have on the same plane. Right, good, good. That's a, that's a really, I, I can't satisfy you fully on this question today, but let me, um, let me say something about free speech. <laughs> Since I'm here anyway and I'm standing up. Um, so it's plausible to think, and I think, and J.S. Mill thought, and Milton thought, that individual human beings have a right to free speech, and it is, let's say, in my terms, a primary or a prior right. It's a moral right to free speech we have, even ante any constitutional or bill of rights. It's also true that a court could rule that a corporation has right to free speech, at least a closely held corporation. This would be a disaster if any court ever ruled this. But you can imagine, right? And now you can ask, so now you've got, as it were, a fictitious entity over here with a right to free speech, and you have a natural entity, me, with a right to free speech. And now you could say, well, hang on. If we give corporations or closely held ones a right to free speech, could that conflict with individuals' right to free speech? Oh, yes, it could. And you might say, well, this would be a good, bad idea for imputing to these fictional entities a right to free speech because it could undermine it, notwithstanding that, as you say, it's an entity of a different order, in a sense, yeah? Um, suppose we gave corporations the right to vote. The worry is that we're talking about moral conflicts, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about moral conflicts. I'm talking about, well, I mean, in this case, it's a moral conflict, but I think the conflict between parliamentary sovereignty and popular sovereignty is a moral conflict. Conflict between something that's intrinsically desirable in itself, well, we could say more, yeah? But, for which there's a good moral case, allowing peoples to choose their own constitutions. And a different idea, within a state there being one institution that has a plenitude of power, or there being political organizations, states that have supremacy in their territory and reasonable independence. Those are justified to the extent that we do the way I would justify states and corporations and trade unions and all the other things, instrumentally by the way they serve people's interests. But that doesn't mean that they can't produce real, com real conflicts. I mean, I, I think the free speech case shows that, doesn't it? It's a, it's a real legal conflict. I mean, yes, I know. As to whether it's a real moral conflict, I don't know. Really? If you set up, so well, but what about this? Suppose I, so suppose I start giving, I don't know, dinner plates the right to vote. And now they, dinner plates, you know, vote us or something, or robots, or 
corporations. This sounds like a, this sounds like a moral problem. I'm giving something. I'm wrongly giving something a power that devalues my own powers. No, no. I think that's right. So yeah, I, I, but I accept. I accept the first point. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to suggest, and to the extent that I did, it was a mistake that these are these are uh, coordinate ontologically. Is that a word? I don't know. Maybe it's not. Yeah, I I had a question about. Patrick. Thank you. Uh, just a question about the primordial yes. people and their yes. sovereignty. People. Yes. People, people. So they're not a mob, no. not Kant, no. and they don't disappear in the light of state or parliamentary sovereignty. No, they don't need to, no. No, they don't need to, and you're a latitudinarian about where they go to. Yep, absolutely. Right, but in this um, age of identity politics yep. and, and fragmentary identity, then, um, you know, what, what would you assign and how would you assign uh, people sovereignty. You say the, you know, the ability to act. So would Guy Fawkes be the people? Right. So, so right. So this goes right. So no, this goes back. Well, my, the examples um, I gave to to try to tempt your intuition were, I, I think, uh, lawyers and Freemasons and Presbyterians, um, all of whom have some of these features, but they don't have the other feature. So we would want to spell this out a lot more carefully. I mean, I didn't spell it out at all. You want to say something about how, for example, the capacities of Presbyterians to regulate the lives of other Presbyterians is actually just much less than of any state to regulate constitutionally the lives of its people. Or you might say, although one can have a stake in the Moose Lodge as a member of the Moose Lodge, it's not the same stake as the stake you have as uh, an Irish person in the, in the prospects of Ireland. And of course, these are, there's not going to be any bright line. Whenever, ever in legal philosophy, well, it's the same in law, right? Whenever so, someone says to you, where do you draw the line? The first thing you should say, you don't draw the line, unless you're a judge or you have to draw a line. You try to recognize the considerations that make it more compelling to think of people has this kind of self-determination right and the considerations that make it less compelling. So I tried to pick three, uh, I think I tried to pick three moderately con uh, controversial ones, again, on the other side. Uh, I think I said uh, Kurds, Palestinians, and who were the other ones? Maybe it was Scots, I can't remember my paper. Uh, people that don't now have a state, but plausibly, whether or not you think the state is the right way to go, plausibly can be wronged by having some of their powers of collective control taken away from them. So this is a, a little bit of a, a, a response here to Lee Philippe's er, earlier question. So I'm not asserting that the right amounts to nothing more than prohibition on course of inter-external interference, but that that's one of its incidents. And I think that's a good way to think about pre-legal, you know, a good answer to the Kantian who says before there's an actual legal constitution, there's no people, there's just a mob, a multitude, because no one can act without law, is to say, well, do you think that people could have been wronged in their self-determination before legal systems? Do you think that the Israelites wronged the Canaanites when they enslaved them, raped the women, and slaughtered their children? It seems to me they did. But Canaanites, as far as we know, were a pre-legal society. But they weren't just a mob. There were people who, you know, had a temple and worshipped the god and, I don't know, played board games and whatever, whatever Canaanites did. Thanks very much, Les. That was, that was great. I, I haven't got uh, so much as a challenge, but rather I, I, I was wondering if I could bug you a little bit about something you said at the sure. very, I, very I beginning. I guess what you're going to bug me about. I yeah. Know. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I completely agree that there's some powers uh, at both individual and institutional levels that are just dangerous to have. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if, if one further dimension, so this is more of a, a, a supplement rather than a criticism, uh, but whether uh, some conceptual views of law might be dangerous to have uh, as well. So I've got in mind, yeah. you know, Kelson's view, McCormick on yeah. the European Union. Uh, so for example, if, if if, if a, if a you know, parliament or state or even citizens adopt what, what I would call and, um, uh, and others have called it a sort of state-centric view of law, you know, systemic, uh, if we take Raz's view, there's a comprehensive supreme and open claim to authority. Mm -hmm. um, that particular view of law then uh, sets up particular kinds of political vision, or at least it, it can narrow or broaden the different political options that might be possible to imagine or possible to, to see. Um, and yet it might not be the only way or the best way uh, or even the most popular thinking about law. So I've got, you know, here, here's a concrete example. So 
So McCormick on the early uh, uh, European uh, Court of Justice decisions, the Van Gundem moves, cost on others, uh, he would comment, and even in person he would say things like, it was great that they actually asserted that there's, there's a new legal order here. Yeah. And on certain issues, EU law has supremacy over state member state law. What he regretted and lamented was the fact that the, the court actually went one step further and said not it's only on these issues yeah. is, are these legal norms supreme, but it's in virtue of a, a new supreme legal order that yeah. was. Yeah, he didn't and, like the sound of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one thing is he, what, he, he, he did think you could give up uh, sovereignty in certain instances to, to, that, that would, you, could, you'd, you could celebrate. Uh, and that were uh, good ways. But he also had a view about law. I thought there's a mistaken view of law that was actually fueling the kind of view that you could not give up yeah. sovereignty unless someone, someone took it out. So, so he had sort of a view that there's a conceptually su superfluous addition that the court added by, you know, not only are EU laws supreme on these issues, but in fact it's because of a supreme legal order. And that's a kind of a state-centric view of thinking yeah. about law. Uh, a, just a second, a second example. Mm -hmm. uh, so take, for example, Imagine the thought experiment in, in Canada that uh, on all substantive rights that were claimed by First Nations communities, they were granted, but always granted in terms of a constitutional amendment or some constitutional recognition. Mm -hmm. now, you could still imagine well, that would be that would be that would be great, that'd be improvement, but there'd still be something deficient politically yeah, agree about that, that arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, if if a particular conceptual view about law is is held or prominent, then it be only becomes possible to suppose that, well, it's in virtue of delegation or open uh, openness that legal systems can grant certain claims. And I can imagine Scotland be in a very similar respect. Uh, the passage you were reading, you know, Scottish mm -hmm. independence, it's a permanent part of, but it's still constitutionally delegated part of uh, We UK permit it to be a permanent law. part of our constitution. Yeah, so yeah. just, I want to pick your brain on that question. Yeah. Are there some views about law, conceptually, that may not be the best views or the true views, and yet are also politically dangerous when they're when they're held. Gosh. Uh, uh, probably. Um, <laughs> so look, I'm I'm one of I'm one of these legal theorists who think legal theory is way less important than people like you or Ronald Rourke and others. So, I mean, there are people who think, out there who think you know, if we get unless we get pin this down correctly, there could be big problems in the real world. Now, I think it's true that unless we pin the law down correctly, there could be big problems in the real world. So, law is extremely important, but I'm not sure that unless we pin down the concept of law, the theory of law correctly, there can be big problems in the real world. Because luckily, except for the odd time when Homer nods, like in the Miller decision, judges blissfully ignore everything that I say, or Hart says, or, or happily even Ronald Dworkin. Said, right? Dworkin, who, 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 who pinned his career on legal philosophy being useful to the courts, was studiously ignored by any court to which he ever spoken. No influence at all. And this was the tragedies of his life. He thought that that's how we earned our keep as philosophers, not in deepening our understanding or transmitting culture to the next generation or telling kids about what Plato thought, but by helping judges decide. And I just don't think we know anything that can help judges decide anything. Um, now, so I know that's not exactly where you're going, but, but, you, but you, you have this worry. Um, could a certain piece of conceptual framework wreck our way of thinking about things? And you know, I don't know, I guess it could. But it's really hard to think of cases, even Hart's case, when he says, you know, you've got to be careful with this narrow concept of law, guys. It's hard to find this very persuasive argument. Um, I, the, the cases of where people can do real damage with a piece of philosophy, I think, are few and far between. And, and usually it's not a, at the articulated view. Usually it's something very casual. So here's an, the example when I'm talking with uh, other people about choosing a concept of this or that. The only example that comes to my mind as possibly a real uh, and, a, and I think dangerous case of a philosophic mistake is when people talk either affirmatively or negatively um, about the rights and wrongs of abortion in relation to the moment of conception. So some people will say person ha has per full personality from the moment of conception, and people will say, no, it's later or whatever. Now, the problem is, if there are any biologists in the room will know, there is no moment of conception. That's a mistake. That's not how humans are reproduced. There isn't a moment which is the moment of conception. There is a complex a wave of chemical and other interactions that occur over true seconds. But there's no, there's no point where you can draw it and say this was the moment of conception. And I do think people think that there is a moment of conception. That, it was that on which the doctrine of ensoulment begins, right? That's the moment at which the soul zaps into the fetus. And it would be hard to believe there was such a moment unless you thought there was a moment of conception. And that's just a mistake. Um, 
So I think that's an example. Here's a more far-fetched example, though my late colleague Derek Parfit used to say that because we have a false view about personal identity, ourselves as this kind of essence of thing going through the, the world, you know, uniquely self-subsistently different from every other thing, we're more selfish than we should be. And he, he had metaphysical arguments to think the false, the, the, the first is false. I'm less persuaded by that, although I liked his conclusion that we're too selfish. I mean, there are lots of really selfish Buddhists who reject that view of the self. Yeah? I mean, some of them are slaughtering Rohingya right now in northeast uh, Myanmar. And so there's always a slip twixt cup and lip. You've always got some real cool theory of something, and out there in the world, it doesn't seem to work out so well. And so it may be that some theories about the nature of law do encourage people to miss opportunities or think things are there, but it's just hard to see to see how it happens with some regularity. I also distrust, and I know you didn't ask this, but I'm going to take advantage of the floor to make this point, since for all I know someone thinks this false thing, that, that legal theorists can choose their concepts. So that's to, think, uh, that's to think legal philosophy is like a statute, and we can stipulate and say, in the, for the purposes of this statute, a carbonated beverage shall mean. But that's not what we do in philosophy. Try to figure out what carbonated beverage is. So all this talk about choosing concepts, I have no, I'm sorry, I got no I'm not pinning this on you, but, you, but you, you understand the kind of view I'm trying to address. We should choose a healthier concept of law. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. There are a lot of questions now. Professor Pilkington. Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I'm, I'm very interested in your distinction between uh, political sovereignty and yeah. parliamentary yes. sovereignty and wonder if you could comment on whether proportional representation oh. makes any difference to that. Yeah. And also about yeah. our rather more complicated yeah. system of having an effect divided sovereignty between right. different yeah. levels of government. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very helpful. And um, I wish I could say more on the electoral system. I know, I know that we're wondering about that in Canada now again, or we may be. Um, so I, I hope it comes out at least in the chinks in this paper, I'm quite hostile to the UK constitutional theory. I'm in favor of a divided, shared sovereignty, not perhaps as gridlocked as the US system. Um, and I believe the unfashionable thing, this is why I was tweaking my, I see they've left, tweaking my former colleagues about the charter and all that. I actually think sometimes the courts, and not just the legislature, can be the actual voice of the people. Uh, I know that's not a popular view in this law school, but I think it's true in some cases, not just in John Hart Erie cases, but in other cases. So I'm all in favor of that. And I, I would want to, um, so Mike, you invite me to comment. On, my feeling is that um, divided sovereignty, the word dialogue used to be popular here. Maybe it's not anymore. But anyway, the dialogic sovereignty, divided sovereignty is a response. I mean, one you know, reasonable response to the kind of conflicts um, that I'm trying to point to uh, in that one. Now. I, I think our electoral system here and the one in the UK is crazy. Um, ditto, of course, electoral college and so forth. And, and the difficulty is always trying to get one that is a fair representation of the popular will, whatever that means. And um, I think I could go out on the limb and say that to the extent that popular sovereignty, so th think of a ratification vote. Um, popular sovereignty were expressed in a ratification vote for constitution through something like our territorial system, it would be a disaster. And it's a very interesting fact about referendums in the EU and UK is that they have never um, worked through constituencies. They've always been you know, basically one person, one vote, and we count them all up, and your vote counts. And the turnout in referendums, I know there are other reasons, but the turnout in referendums is always way higher than elections. Because you know that your vote could be the vote, 50% plus one vote. That, that could be your vote. Not going to happen in parliamentary election or congressional Not election. Canadian. Not Canadian. <laughs> no, no, just so, just so. Professor David. Yeah, I was just going to um, comment on um, the, the interesting case of you know international treaties and what it means for them to be binding. Yeah. Right. The, the, the expectation is that it's an agreement between two sovereigns, which means that one doesn't become subject to the other, and typically yeah. they the two don't make themselves subject to a third party adjudicator yeah. either. Um, yeah. So essentially, agreement has to be a fact. Which, which is why in, in some treaty-making discourse, pe people talk about mm. 
um, polishing the covenant chain regularly just to make sure that it doesn't rust. Oh, nice. I like right? that. Does, does the fact of agreement continue? Right? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a relationship that has to be maintained. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't remember all the details of this, but there's a lot of interesting philosophizing about this in the, in the negotiations leading up to the, the Treaty of Peace between the new United States and Great Britain. Mm -hmm. um, where the diplomats exchanged a lot of these ideas in the United States insisted, no, we're not going to have our existence recognized by treaty. You have to recognize it before we talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was the question of whether um, to be effective, the treaty had to be ratified by parliament. And I think, I, I'm not totally sure, but I think the view that prevailed was, no, it doesn't have to be ratified by parliament. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the whole point of this dispute is that parliament is not sovereign in these territories. Mm -hmm. You know, so once once the treat once the treaty is effective, Parliament simply is no longer sovereign there. So we're, mm -hmm. so ratification by Parliament is irrelevant to that kind of treaty. Um, so that's that's just an that's John. That's that's helpful. So I, I I don't know any of any of that bit of history at all. And there certainly on the general question about um, oh, continuing yes. force of treaties and relational contracts. And there's usually about twenty people in this room know more about this stuff than I do. So I'd be skating on even even thinner ice um, than I can. Can I even add something? It's not contradictory, just, not, just a further thought that I'm sometimes troubled by. It's possible to think of treaty norms as not being laws in the way that we don't think of contractual norms as being a source of law. They're just binding amongst the parties, setting aside complex multilateral treaties or treaties that then give rise or on the back of which you get customary, standing customary norms. So it's possible to say, probably someone to say in response to that part of my story that that's just a misprision from the get-go. Uh, because we don't have general norms in conflict with each other. It's just an ordinary problem of when contracts bind and, yeah. But thank, thank you for the, the point about um, independence of the several states, because uh, not only do I not know anything about that, because that's a common enough answer, I didn't even think about that. So I will go away and think about that. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Les. It's it's very nice to hear your voice in this room again. <laughs> I, I As I've been here, I. This afternoon, I've been realizing how much I missed it. So it's uh, nice. Um, and this is heady stuff for a humble legal historian of criminal law like myself. Um, but I, I wonder, I'm struggling a bit with, and maybe it's the uh, between your notion of state sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty, yeah. and and whether whether the word sovereignty, notwithstanding the title of your pa of your talk and paper, is um, is what's hanging me up because. Mm. Um, because I worry that you're, uh, humbly, I wonder whether you are still defining state in parliamentary terms. And, oh. uh, and uh, so I, you know, I'm old fashioned, you know, I guess yeah. not just a humble legal historian, but kind of, I still remember Althusser and thinking of the, <laughs> right. the state being quite different. And right, relative autonomy of the state. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I wrote good. down here. Good, thank you, yeah. Um, Yes, you're right. In fact, I was thinking about it in, I was thinking about the state in, not necessarily in parliamentary terms, but in, well, not only in international terms, but yeah, partly through the lens of public international law. But yes, I'm not, yes, that's absolutely right. And, and um, I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not going to entertain that as a criticism, I just say, but there is another view about the state, and we might say another way, maybe I glanced at this a little when I said somewhere early-ish, that when we think about sovereignty, some people say either that's not what matters or that's not what, what it's really about. It's more about effective power and control, say, of social classes. And, you know, as Lenin tells us, the, the uh, 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 Committee for the Bourgeoisie, um, you know, and I just said a couple of very flip things there about trying to persuade you we should think of the state in a kind of more lawyerly, mm -hmm. normative way. But I, they wouldn't persuade a serious materialist about the state. Yeah. So no, you're 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 not. Uh, there's no misprision. That that's where I was coming from, and I would certainly want to shore it up if I, if I thought I was an unfriendly audience. <laughs> um, I just wanted to return to the question posed by uh, my colleague earlier because yeah. I've been uh, also wondering, as you spoke, and been ruffled by the notion of the pre-legal communities. Pre-legal pre pre people. Yes. So you think you're, you're thinking of people before they were law, or people before law? 
Right. And I, I just was wondering, as you answered in a very creative way, that question about whether it matters yeah. who we exclude, uh, whose laws we exclude when we think about law in certain ways. Uh, if you were familiar with the, lit the, the jurisprudence on Aboriginal uh, law questions in Canada and the ways in which um, the lack of ability by Canadian courts to apprehend Indigenous laws actually does real damage uh, here in this country in a very tangible mm -hmm. way. So I just wanted you to, I just wanted to know if yeah. that had sprung to mind and if so, what I th I you said about that. I thought that's where was coming from. I mean, he was thinking about probably about a different, a different uh, body of norms. But so the, I think there are two questions here and I like to think of these as different. The first question is, when we're trying to be a legal theorist, we're trying to understand all the different norms that govern society, you know, custom, power, etiquette, law, soft law, all this stuff. We're trying to pin down, for the sake of this little fun business we do called legal theory, pin down what law is. Uh, should we give weight to pragmatic or moral considerations? Should we try to make it you know, moral hygiene. Should we think about law in a way that makes us happier, better, and everything? And I resist that for two reasons. One, I don't think that identifying, say, what law is, is a matter of moral hygiene. It's a matter of trying to understand the shape of concepts that are partly independent of us and certainly independent of the courts, right? So, because law, law is not just a matter for the courts. Law is a matter for our whole culture and society. So we're trying to understand that. So here's the first question. Uh, when we look at uh, norms that govern indigenous peoples, I mean, forget Canada, T take a place where they're, they have a better, in better entrenched in the system. Think, think about New Zealand, right? the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, but when we look at those norms, should we think that they're very similar to the municipal system of the modern state, very different, or a bit similar and a bit different, or, you know? So that's one question, and that's the question the legal theorist worries about. And then there's the next, if you want, political question, which goes like this, never mind the first question, how should we engage and treat these people in our courts? Now, I just think that's a different question. So here, here's a, let me give you um, an example that's orthogonal to this, uh, but it's been much in the press. What's a woman? Think about transgendered people, yeah? So here's a view that's not crazy. I'm not saying it's correct, but it's not crazy. And it, an essential, inherent part of our concept of a woman is someone who is either born biologically female and or had a bunch of stereotypical female experiences in coming to adulthood. So it's not just where you, how you, it's how you get there, right? Here's a different view. No, uh, being a woman is purely ascriptive. It's like being a, a Presbyterian. If you take, what, what do Presbyterians do? I know, I'm, that's what I must be a Presbyterian. I, mean, I can tell I'm not in England. I've got a room full of 20 people. Anyway, you know, you-, you, you it's fine ways to suck the joy. You're, you're Presbyterian. You don't have to be born a Presbyterian. Thank you. Uh, I, I know. I just thought it might be one. Um, and so some people take a highly ascriptive view, right? So there's a whole lot of grief right now about, you know, for example, Jermaine Greer. Now, I just think there are two questions here. There's a question about our concept of a woman. And is Caitlin Jennings a woman or not? Uh, with respect to our concept. And then there's a question of how we engage with and relate to and negotiate with um, deal with, make love with people who are transgendered, whether we allow them to use our bathrooms or not. And I don't think any of that stuff is helped or hindered. So unlike Mike, I think none of this stuff is helped or hindered by the truth or falsity of Jermaine, Green's, Jermaine Greer's claim. I understand why people get pissed off at her, but that's because of the serious po policy moral matters, yeah? Think about it the other way around. So flip it around. Suppose that, um, the Canadian courts were doing well by indigenous peoples. Not just the courts, the legislature. I mean, it's a far fantasy, right? But we're actually doing well by them, as far as one can in, in these difficult, we were actually doing well morally and politically by them. And yet, that presupposed or committed us to or jived with some rather unattractive theory, according to which their norms were custom and convention, but not really law. Would you care if we were doing well by them? I mean, I wouldn't. I think we care because sometimes we fear that people respond, say, to non-state norms that aren't law, 
by doing the other bad things to them, the part two things to them, and say, oh, and therefore, by the way, we don't care about substance abuse on your territory, or therefore, we'll just run this pipeline through without your consent. None of that, fall, none of that turns on whether they have legal systems or not. None of it. It's a moral political question about how to respond to other people. It's, there's not some truth about legal philosophy that stands, you know, it's not because of some false legal theory that Aboriginal people are in such a parlous state in this country. I mean, that's to put people like me in a godlike position. I mean, it's, it's because of really awful politics o over centuries. I don't mean now, I mean, it's getting, I'm, I'm not so pessimistic. It's not because someone, now there are cases, and I tried to offer one, which is the moment of conception, which I think screws up people's theory, and oh, that was a bad choice of words. Um, <laughs> bridles people's thinking in, an in a regrettable way, because it really isn't the moment of conception. But I, I don't see, I, you know, if someone says to me, well, you know, here's the thing, they've got law, but it's not an actual legal system, or as I would say, you know, it's quite a lot like law. It's not law, but it's quite a lot like it. I don't feel, I don't feel moved to vote this way or that way on a pipeline. I don't care if it's law or not. That's a problem for the legal theorist, right? Well, why would you care? It's subject to sovereignty mm -hmm. sovereignty. Yes. Sovereignty versus sovereignty versus sovereignty. But I thought that would feel funny on a title. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out as a legal theorist what, what's the truth about these things. And I refuse to be disciplined in figuring out what the truth is by it, but what I think would be the right way to vote on it. Now, it's pertinent to it because part of the spin of my argument, as, as, as Francois rightly says, is that one of these three is a genuine moral ideal that we have to honor. And the other two are institutional confections that we should care about to the extent that they help out other ideals. So that is a moral political claim, for sure. But it's not a definitional claim, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just, Hi. Yes, sir, Chris Alvinetti. Hi, Chris. Um, uh, I'm just, to follow up on that discussion, yeah. I'm just trying to understand what makes Canadian law, law, oh, with, yeah. if we take out the theory, right? Yeah. It, uh, what, like what, what reasoning What's or the difference what, between how are we justifying the exclusion the of one Good. type of legal system? Okay, but let's, as so let's law not use the word exclusion. Right? Or, or just what, I don't get to exclude anything. I'm just, no, I'm just I mean, the, why, what, makes, what makes theory um, Correct. or the philosophy of law irrelevant to the determination of an indigenous legal system as such? Well, because suppose, suppose, to, suppose yeah. that uh, um, Caitlin Jennings isn't really a woman. That is not a reason not to treat her as if she were a woman. It's not a reason not to let her use the woman's loo, right? Bathroom. It's not. Imagine standing in the bathroom door and, you know, having a big complicated theoretical philosophical theory. Say, so can't you in the bathroom because of my theory? Why would you do that to somebody? On the other hand, it would seem weird to say, listen, we sh she should be allowed to use the woman's loo. Therefore, all this hard work we've been doing about biology, about evolution, about sociology, the social construction of gender, all that's crazy. The key thing is, can she use the bathroom or not? And that's going to drive our theory. That's the race to the bottom line. That's thinking like an advocate, not thinking like a, like a philosopher or a theory. Listen, custom and convention can be enforced by the courts. No, Sometimes it is. Okay, so forget courts for a minute, okay? The courts have their own theory about the law. And it may well be wrong. In fact, some, someone, Francois, mentioned my on online activities. You'll see me tearing shreds of the, into the UK Supreme Court today for saying silly things about the recognition rule that they should never mention in their judgment. The judges should decide on the law. And there is a doctrinal answer in Canadian law of what Canadian law is. Yeah? That's a job for lawyers and courts and law professors and at the margins, the legal theorist, yeah? It differs in different countries. So in England, uh, Blackstone is not a source of law. It's just a persuasive account of the state of the law in 17, help me, help me, John will know. Blackstone, 17, there you go, 1766. It's a good thing about this law school, someone knows the answer to every possible question, someone knows. Um, it's a state of that, but it's not, it's not a source of law. Compare, Scotland. Erskine and Stair, institutional writers of the 17th century, they're a source of law. Subordinate, but in Scottish courts, if you can't find statute, and you can't find a case law, then you can turn and are bound to turn, not just as persuasive indication of what the state of law is, you're bound to turn as a source of law to Erskine and Stair. So you say, well, wait a minute, how can it be that Blackstone is not a source of law in England, but Stair is a source of law in Scotland? And that's a very important question. I mean, I could, I've, 
it probably, it's probably not useful to explain why it is, but it has a lot to do with the attitude of the courts in the two jurisdictions, and, and other people. But, you know. So I think that too. So Canadian courts can decide to treat anything they want. Well, I, I, there are limits, but it's not worth going into it. You know, if the Canadian courts started treating the Quran tomorrow as a source of law, it would become a source of law. Panda. Sure. On these no last the notes of wisdom, the dean started, finished actually his introduction by stating that he knew who the winner of the struggle between sovereignty and sovereignty would be. Well, after listening to your talk, I think the real winner is us. Thank you very much, Les, for gracing us with your presence. Thank you for shedding a bit of light on something that is of consequence, uh, as opposed to just legal theory writ large, as you <laughs> suggested earlier. Thank you very much for delivering the 2017 RMIT lecture. Please join me in thanking Les for making some progress. <laughs>